Hey guys, so in today's video I want to discuss with you the experiences I've had exploring Blackfoot mythology and sacred Native American sites here in southern Alberta. Stay tuned. <laughs> This summer, my fiance and I decided to go down and visit Riding on Stone Provincial Park. We're just on our way out to Riding on Stone Provincial Park, and we're going to be going out there to look for some rock paintings that were put in place by the Blackfoot Indians. So, from what I've understood, the Blackfoot Indians would use sweat lodges to enter altered states of consciousness, and so what I'm out to look for are examples of where the Blackfoot Indians might have recorded experiences of entering altered states of consciousness. You see, this is something we see in a variety of prehistoric, aboriginal, and paleolithic traditions. We find among the San Bushmen their experiences of entering altered states, and then they would record those experiences in the form of the rock art. We also find among the Europeans the cave paintings. It's believed that people would enter altered states of consciousness by going down into the caves and enduring sensory deprivation for great lengths of time. Unfortunately, today there are not very many people who know the original and tension behind much of the rock art. But the one thing that I found really interesting was the depiction of the shield-bearing warriors. It was explained by our tour guide that the shield-bearing warriors would depict images that they had received in dreams on the front of their shields. Also, the Blackfoot Native Indians will use dream images to decorate the outside of their teepees. And these images are quite sacred. In fact, if someone is going to pass a painting on a teepee on to someone else. There's a specific ceremony that has to be performed in order for that to be done. There were a number of really fascinating things that we discovered, specifically some of the oldest rock art styles found in North America. These were made by someone chipping pieces of the rock away with a small piece of bone, and some of this can be dated as early as perhaps 5,000 years ago. So one of the panels I found really fascinating was actually the first on the tour, and this seems to depict a buffalo that might be being depicted as being shot with arrows. I'm not 100% sure of this, but it does appear as if there are perhaps arrows piercing the buffalo, and then you have some figures standing off to the right. And I couldn't help but be reminded of some of the images that we see among the Sand Bushmen and the Lascaux cave paintings over in Europe, in which you will find these depictions of the shaman entering the spirit world in order to accompany the soul of the animal of the hunt. So in the case of the Sand Bushmen, we see the shaman entering the spirit world, accompanying the eland. So the eland has been shot and it is dying. Its head is, you know, leaning down and the shaman has his hair standing on end. He is entering an altered state of consciousness. Is similarly, in Lascaux, we see the, butt, the belly of the buffalo that has been torn open with a spear. And then off to the left, you see the shaman who appears to be entering the spirit world in order to accompany the spirit animal. So this is a common theme where in which the people in the community, the shamans in the community, would accompany the soul of the buffalo or the soul of the eland into the spirit world. So I couldn't help but wonder if maybe perhaps this is what we're seeing in Writing on Stone, Provincial Park, is a scene similar to this. On our way home, I pulled over onto the side of the highway and I went over to where some erosion had taken away some of the hillside. And I managed to find for myself a, a stone on which I could do a little bit of rock art of my own. So I decided that I would depict the experiences of my own spiritual journey. You can see here off to this side, I've depicted the red entity that I saw during that experience as well as the solar eclipse and the patterns that emerged from that when I was having that, that dreaming experience. And in fact, this is now the logo for the channel. But I think you guys can hopefully appreciate that the interpretation of these things is incredibly difficult. I mean, looking at that, how would you ever know that there was such an elaborate story behind those images? I mean, the, the full testimonial of my experience is a full hour in the video, Jesus, what are you doing here? So, I mean, that was an incredibly in-depth experience, which I've summed up just with a couple of drawings. So that's the big challenge with trying to understand rock art, is it's not a complete story. It might just be segments or little bits of a spiritual experience that are really only understood when the original experiencer explains the contents of those paintings. But there are certain things that we can infer by looking at the rock art.
One of the things that was talked about while I was there was the story of Nappy and the Rock. Nappy is the old man of Blackfoot mythology, and he's the trickster deity of their tradition. And there's this lovely story where he offers his jacket to a rock, and then when a storm comes, he decides to take it back. And the rock was so upset that it chased him across the prairies. And the place in which the rock has settled is just outside of Okotoks. It's actually a glacial erratic that was left there during the Ice Age. And we went there to check it out. And they say that you can find rock paintings there. And sure enough, I found some Native American paintings and rock art. But the other thing you're confronted with when you go to these sites is the incredible amount of graffiti and just sacrilege, I would call it. I mean, many of the people who have come to these places have completely desecrated them. And there's little, if any, respect for the sanctity of these places. But I was so inspired by all of this that I decided to pick up a copy of Percy Bullchild's The Sun Came Down. And this is a written account of the oral traditions that Percy Bullchild received from the Blackfoot elders when he was a child. So I want to read for you guys a short quote from that book. Before undertaking the spirit journey, one must have the necessary things. The smoking pipe, the tobacco, your flint and striker, the dry moss, and most of all, the incense. Cedar boughs, sweet grass, sweet pine, juniper boughs, sage, or pine moss. The vision quest and the seeking of power is not an easy task. After you find the right location for the quest, which has to be several days' walk away from anyone else, the spirit will test your bravery. If you stand the test, then you will receive the power. You cannot drink or eat anything for four days. Only incense and prayers can be had. The first night, the spirit will likely not bother you. It will simply check you over. But the second night is usually when the spirit will begin to test you. Away in the darkness of the night, the spirit will try to scare you away from your spot. The spirit may throw you around, drag you by your feet, and pull your hair. Anything short of killing you. If you're lucky, this will go on for only the one night. But in most instances, it will go on for at least two nights, or right up to the fourth night. But if you stay with it and you don't give way to the fear, then the spirit will give you its power. After the test, the spirit will put you into a trance or a deep sleep. After you have proven your bravery, and while you are in the trance, the spirit will instruct you on precisely what it is that you are to do. If there is a song, which there usually is, the spirit will teach you that song. If anyone tries to use this power with evil or selfish intentions, then the power will fold back onto them and they will have that power taken away. So learning about this, I immediately recognized that we were dealing with an incredibly powerful and ancient spiritual tradition among the Blackfoot. I decided that I wanted to go out and visit sites that hadn't been marred by graffiti and irreverence, but at the same time I recognized the importance of protecting the sacredness of these places and not offending the spiritual powers that live there. But I recognize that there's a real problem with this, and this is something, you know, I was doing a little bit of research on getting permission to film in these locations, and a lot of the Native Americans, they don't want people to film out there, and they don't want people to even know these sites exist. So that night I came home and I had a vivid dream in which I found myself in a home and I was standing in this room and there was a bed in front of me and I had this pair of jeans that I was holding in my hand and I distinctly remember feeling as though either I had purchased these blue jeans or someone else had purchased these blue jeans. I remember that being important in the dream. These were purchased blue jeans. And so I laid the jeans down into a bed and I covered them up with the bedding and when I pulled the sheets back over, there was a white man laying there, kind of a cowboy type. And he sort of sat up in the bed and I said to him, how did you get here? And he says, I don't know. And I asked him, well, I just put blue jeans in this bed and suddenly here you are. How did you get here? And he goes, I really don't know. And it seemed to me that he was kind of really not with it. He seemed to be kind of, you know, a little bit dense. And it just so happened that outside of the room and around the corner, there was a white man, a physician, who was sitting at a table talking with a few other people. So I led this cowboy out there and I sat him down across from the doctor. And I immediately got the sense that this doctor was somehow responsible for the condition of this man. The fact that he seemed almost lobotomized and impotent and just emotionally not there. He sort of sat hunched over in the chair as if there was no energy, no power in his form or his body. And I recognized that the doctor seemed to be somehow responsible for this, that he was responsible for basically removing this man's soul. I felt a little bit disturbed by the dream and I remember being in a kind of hypnagogic state 
and having a variety of strange thoughts and visions in my mind, and I immediately thought to myself, the interpretation of the dream is the key for understanding this experience. And so I immediately went to work trying to understand what was meant by the blue jeans in the bed. And I got the sense after listening to the dream and studying it that what this spirit was saying to me was that white man is so materialistic, all you need do is gather together a bunch of purchased goods, lay them down in a bed, and if you come back later, it will produce a white man. That's to say, Western people are so materialistic, they are only the sum of their purchased products. So the purchasing of goods and services is really all that constitutes a materialistic white man. And then I also recognized the role of the physician, this doctor who was sitting at the table. This was the white version of the medicine man, but he was not responsible for healing the soul of this cowboy, no. He was simply interested in drugging him up, basically removing his soul. You go to a white doctor, you go to a physician, they don't actually help you to understand the contents of the unconscious mind. They just simply prescribe you drugs. They give you Ritalin, they give you Prozac, they give you antidepressants, drugs that suppress the experience of these emotions, so that the individual is essentially left lobotomized with no experience of the intuitive life. And this is the evil work of the white doctor, the white medicine man. And then at that point, I entered a hypnagogic state in which I felt as if I saw a Native American man, an elderly Native American man with, with you know, wrinkles across his forehead and long hair, and he had a red feather in the back of his hair. This was during a hypnagogic state, right in between being awake and being asleep. And he was surrounded by a ring of smoke, and he was almost insisting that I not look at him. And I communi I said, you know, I can't help but look at you. I mean, you're here in my in my mind, you know. <laughs> and I was trying to not, you know, offend the spirit. And after the dream and after the experience I had, I immediately recognized why. It's because the white man is infected with an illness, with a sickness. It's the sickness of materialism, like a cancer in Western society. And this is something I talk about a lot on this channel. The fact that we do not value our dreams or our experiences of altered states of consciousness means that we are completely divorced from the reality of the unconscious mind. We are completely divorced from the experience of the spirit world. And so in that sense, white man has become a source of evil, a source of wickedness in the world that simply propagates this need for utilitarian materialism. If it's not useful in some physical way, then it's no good for anything. And it all belongs to this myth of progress that has infected our society and is now threatening the natural environment and is spreading across the world, destroying religion, destroying spiritual beliefs of every sort and kind. So if anyone watching this belongs to the Blood Nation, the Kainai, the Siksika Nation, any of the First Nations in this area, please feel free to reach out and contact me. I've had a really difficult time getting in touch with anyone in the First Nations community. My email is down in the description, so if you watch this, you have concerns, questions, anything at all, please feel free to contact me. Otherwise, you know, if you guys, if you enjoyed watching this, as always, I'd ask you to like, subscribe, and share. Be sure to hit that notification bell so you know when I come out with new content. And as always, thanks for watching.